Yes, praise the Lord, everyone. Glad to be here on this, they call it Father's Day. Um, praying that all the men who are fathers, those who are acting like fathers, those who have been fathers and have gone on to glory, um, we are here to acknowledge the um, the day and um, we'll be talking about fathers and uh, just letting you know that um, already today has been a, a very good day for me. Um, went and uh, went to a worship service and from there uh, the wife took me out on a lunch date to one of my favorite places, May May's, right in Chiquimula, Guatemala. And so, got to give them a shout out, uh, because their owner, Marco, is also a father, father of two. And so, um, we just greet you today with Jesus joy. We're not going to prolong this, and uh, we know that many of you might uh, be busy with activities for the men in your lives, um, but at least we'll have this recorded so that if you're not able to join us live, you can catch us uh, afterwards either on Facebook or you can catch us on YouTube. Just go to Adoration Talk Radio on YouTube and make sure that you uh, catch us. And if you really like it, uh, subscribe to the channel. If you really, really like it, get the uh, notifications for every time we are actually posting. And if you really, 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 really like us, uh, make sure you like us and share us uh, on that platform. With that said, I'm going to um, ask my wife if I can actually just lead in prayer uh, today. And then from there, she will kind of lead us off, and uh, I'll finish up like we normally do. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this glorious day, a day that in certain parts of the world we acknowledge as Father's Day, uh, but also knowing that every day that we have an opportunity to open our eyes and to experience life once again, it is always Father's Day. You being our Heavenly Father. You being the inspiration for all that we do and say. You being the one who governs our tongue and who motivates our hearts. You being the lover of our souls. And we thank you, Lord God, for the world that you have given us to live in. We know that that world has problems. We know that sometimes this world doesn't even really like us or like you. But nevertheless, you have us here at a time and a place in history that has never, ever been experienced before, where the revelation of all of the prophets of old are manifesting themselves right before our eyes, and you saw fit that we would be the ones who would be the ones that would proclaim your gospel in these perilous times. Not the heroes of the Bible, not those that have been prophetic, not those who have been heroic, but just the common people like me and Myra and our audience that have given us the chance to represent well in this end time season. So Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. And even as we are sharing today, may you be glorified and may we say something to encourage not just men, but to encourage all to just know that it's only through your word and through Christ Jesus that we can have the answers of our hearts finally uh, quenched and that we can then go out and share your holy word with the nations. Father, we love you, we honor you, and we adore you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, there's so much to be said about fathers. Um, the Bible is full of that because our Heavenly Father is the creator of all things. 
in Matthew 6, when Jesus is on the mountain, he's talking to the multitude, and he comes forth with this prayer. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. All of this is asked of our Father because Jesus is teaching them that everything they need and everything that, that they want should be from the Father. And the things that they need, the food, the bread, the daily bread, the things that they have uh, done wrong, like their debts, their misdeeds, asking for forgiveness. But talking about the kingdom, let your kingdom come, your, your will be done. And as you know, believers in God, they know that they knew that it wasn't just about this earth, it was also heaven. They understood that in the Old Testament. So the Father in heaven, blessed be his name, hallowed be his name. But how, you know, he, he talks about, and also in Matthew 23, now he's talking about leadership. He says, do not call anyone on earth your father, but one is your father. One, capital O, is your father, he who was in heaven. And he's not taking the father name of father away from the relationship as a father and a son and a father and a daughter. He's taken away from leadership. Mm. He's talking to leaders because that's important that the top context of father be used in the right manner. In Psalm 139, it talks about that we were formed, that he, you, formed my inward parts. You covered me. In my mother's womb, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. There are fathers out there, or men, let's say men, that brag about how many children they have and how many children they had here and there and everywhere. That's not a father. God is the creator of all things. And that is including us. And as he made each of us, he made those fathers. So they need to respect that even what their natural body has helped to produce, it's, it's all about God. He is the true father. He is the true creator. He covered, it says he covered me in my mother's womb. David speaking to him. He formed his inward parts. He just, God created a, a, a formula on how that would work. But he is still the author of everything. And when, we, when a father realizes that, he will praise him. Because he has made him, the father, the earthly father, fearfully and wonderfully made to be able to do and to be a father. This is marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. But how does the Father work that out? In 1st Thessalonians 2, 11, 12, it says, As you know how we exhorted and comforted, if this is Paul talking to the Thessalonians, he says, As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This is a template. Because a true father, an earthly father, hears from God and, and looks at his example. And, and he knows he has to exhort. He, he's there to comfort, but he's also to charge, which means to challenge his own children. But he can't do all this if he doesn't have that relationship with God. He can't walk that true fatherhood out without knowing and understanding the ways God treats us as children of God. In Joshua twenty four fifteen, it talks about the authority of a father and a choice. Because Joshua talks to these people 
that have just conquered everything and they they have they have come to a new land and they they're starting freedom a, a way of life they've never in their generation known and he says to them and if it seems evil to you to serve the lord he's telling them because he knows the hearts of the men and the, the men he's talking to the men basically because they're the leaders he says and, and if it seems evil to you to serve the lord choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But he says with authority, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, it says the we, that's the authority. He's not saying I will serve the Lord. He has authority over his house and he knows that. He says we will serve the Lord. In Ephesians 6, it, it further gives some instructions to fathers. It says, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Now, it doesn't mean that your children won't be mad at you. But if you come in, you're the kind of father that comes in and t doesn't know the Lord, obviously. Drunk and, and disheveled and mean and just ungodly. You are going to provoke your children to wrath. But we as children of God, we ought to know better. That if our children are uh, angry at us, because of something we have said that they need to be corrected on, that's their problem. Because we have to follow God. And as the Father, he has the authority. And if he's hearing from God, then what he speaks is what he speaks. And how the child responds is how that child will learn that there are consequences. <laughs> but it continues to say, but bring, up, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And that doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, darling, oh, you, you can't do anything wrong. That's fine. You, you're perfect. You, you, no. That means the father is knowledgeable about what is good for the child. Because he's hearing from God. In Hebrews 12, 3, 11, he's talking to the fathers. To consider him who endured and such hostility from sinners against himself. He's talking about Jesus. Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls, you have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening, chastising of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. He's talking to a father. Not to a child. He's talking to a father. And he's telling him that you're going to have to be chastised sometime because you may mistake. You may slip. Don't be discouraged when you are rebuked by him because that's his responsibility. Just as a father is responsible to, to act in the same manner with his children. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And for whom a parent loves, he chastens. And scourges every son whom he receives. So that child is yours, be it by your blood or adoption and choice. That's yours. You receive that child. You endure chastening. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there with whom a father does not chasten? Should. There's no perfect children out here. But if you are without chastening of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Because what are you producing in your children? Children who don't know how to take a rebuke. Children who don't understand how to hear and to consider what a parent is saying to them, especially when it's a godly parent. We're talking about someone that hears from God. And we pay them respect. Because we would, we would chase and we pay them respect. Furthermore, we have had human fathers. I, I misread that. For, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. I know as when I was growing up, my dad spanked us with a belt. Did I get up and say, I can't stand this man. You are terrible. 
or even mumble. No, I didn't. I took it and went to sleep with tears on my on my cheeks and got out the next day. It was another day. I could do better. <laughs> but I respected my father. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father for the father spirits and live? He is our spiritual father. And he governs everyone. And since he has placed fathers as heads over the family, it's very, very important for them to understand the spirit should be alive in them and that they will live that out. For they indeed for a few days chasten us as seemed best to them. This is our earthly father. But he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. God has a purpose in our lives that we will be holy. Does that not also include the purpose of a godly, earthly father to try to produce that in his own children? To strive to do that? To be commissioned to do that? Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. But painful. Life is hard. And when we fall, it hurts. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. This morning in our um, service, the young man that was sharing had used examples of different men of the Lord. And he went from Abraham to Job to even Joseph, who became a father eventually with two children. But he, each of these people relied upon the Lord. Were they perfect? No. But they were perfect in their determination to follow him, their father. And sometimes they slipped, but they slipped, but they did not stay in that muck and mire, they turned around and corrected what needed to be corrected. And they are to be honored because they were examples you know, of men who understood their role. In John 17, 1, and this is something that I, it, just, it just hit me. And my husband may correct me later, and I'm, I'm very up. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready for it. But this, I was reading this in John 17, 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. And isn't that the role of a father? He's not doing it, so he says, I'm the, get that. Edge, you know that with the ribbon around it the best father in the, he's doing it to glorify the Lord and this is the part that really got me he wanted God to glorify him as we should too but it's like an unction it's anointing that anointing doesn't always stay with us the anointing over Jesus' life is forever. But we have that spirit within us to help us to make those right decisions as fathers and to correct in the correct way, to do all the things that fathers have to do. But to ask, to seek that from the Father. Lighten me up, because I looked the word up in the dictionary so I could see something. It says bestowing honor, praise, or admiration. But it says to elevate to celestial glory. Because when we're walking in the anointing of God as a father, imagine what that would do in the hearts of the children. It also said to light up brilliantly, to represent as glorious. Because the anointing of God is within us, in his spirit. And when we are shining like that, when we are ex you know, ex expressing that unction of God we're being glorified because we're really glorifying him because it's the Holy Spirit it's not 
we won't be seen anymore. The Father won't be seen anymore, the earthly Father. But the heavenly Father, he's saying, I know that was God. And we've heard people say that. But when you know it's God, it's not the person. It's the unction of God over their lives. It's the anointing of God, of allowing the Holy Spirit to be in, domi in dominate, dominate our own spirit so that we are nothing. The Father is nothing. The earthly Father isn't, isn't there anymore. But the Spirit of the living God is being represented. And He is to be glorified. Wouldn't that be beautiful? That we could see that in each of the Father's today because there's such a, a issue now with allowing the children to be kind of loose but it says the suffering the chastening it's because we don't want to be against when i say we well everyone the flow but when you follow the father the heavenly father you're going to be against the flow you're not going to raise your children the same way. You're not even going to represent yourself the same way. You're going to speak up when someone says something foolish. Oh, let them go. They're going to learn it anyway. Let them be with that, those kids like that because, you know, hey, it's part of it. They need to know about that. But if, you, if you're if you hearing from God and he says, no, you don't want them immersed in that kind of relationships. I know generations have changed. Our parents wouldn't allow us to do some of the things we allow some of our kids to do. But if we listen to God, if we listen to the Father, God Almighty, those things would change and the generations would change because that's, that's the challenge this day. What's the next generation going to be like who are being fathered today? I know there are some that are going to be wonderful. They're going to represent Christ in everything they do. But there's so many more that won't because they won't even know who the Father is. They won't even know who the Heavenly Father is, nevertheless their own Father. And it might be someone they don't even want to know or don't need to know. But you know what? There's always a promise in the Word of God that we all can repent. Even those fathers who are not walking in the way that they should, they can repent and turn away and be the father that God has called them to be. So on this Father's Day, you know, this not like we're not talking about, oh, the Father, this is, uh, no. We're talking about our Heavenly Father because that's where everything starts. There's a scripture, it has nothing to do with what we are saying, but it's, I love it anyway. But it says, this is the Lord's doing, and it's beautiful in my eyes. And we want to say that about fatherhood, earthly fatherhood. This is the Lord's doing, because he's the only one that can do it. He is the only one that can do it. And it is wonderful in our eyes. Amen. Amen. You know, <laughs> I was wondering why uh, my beautiful wife put me on blast about John 17:1. Um, as if there was anything to actually be uh, critical about. Um, I do understand what is being done there, and especially when you put it into the context of understanding that all of John 17 is the true Lord's Prayer. Okay, not the model prayer, but the true Lord's Prayer and when you understand the uh, motivations, because this is the prayer. I mean, this is the one that he was finally able to say to cover the disciples who were with him at the point of his soon-to-be crucifixion. It would cover also the rest of us, both Jew and Gentile, mm -hmm. afterwards. But it was also a, a personal communication between a father and son, which is apropos to talk about today. And it starts off with that relationship with the acknowledgement 
of his reverence of his father and honestly the reverence that a father has with their children. So that's the relationship he's painting the relationship right there. And that's not even what I'm talking about today, but, <laughs> but since she brought it up, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close the, the matter and say, yeah, it's a perfect illustration. It, it reminds me of just a proud papa who, when their children are achieving and doing and following the lessons that have been laid down for them, that it's like, it's not, it's not an arrogance or a pride that would, I would consider to be negative or hurtful or anti-God. It's, it's just the abundance of joy that uh, someone that you had, uh, part of you was able to create through God uh, is doing something just incredible. And it's just like, oh my goodness, can that wonderful person that came from my loins, can, are they the ones that are actually doing these marvelous things and get, uh, achieving these accomplishments? Hey, I am not ashamed. When our children, we got five official, but then, you know, uh, I'm going to brag about other children that are also part of the fold that when any of our children do something, man, I'm right there for them, you know, because it is exciting to see that uh, maybe they heard something that you said, something that maybe they rejected for a minute, but but now they are doing it. Well, there was no rejection between Christ and our Amen. Heavenly Father. And so that was always a perfect union. But he gives us this example, and we fathers ought to follow that example to live a life that's exemplary of that type of honor and respect. Amen. And we should also give that same honor. Just as when uh, Jesus was being uh, baptized by John the Baptist, what does he say? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So that's, those, that's bragging. That's boasting in uh, someone that you care about. So that wasn't my subject, but, Thank you. you know, there you go. So, <laughs> so with that said, um, I had so many ways to approach this, you know, I'm going to confess, I brought this subject up because Myra and I were supposed to be uh, originally talking about praise and worship, and we will be doing that next week, but uh, it hit me, wait a minute, uh, Father's Day is Sunday, maybe we should be talking about fathers, about men, about the world and how men are being treated in this world, so I just want to... Um, let you know that I'm going to say a few uh, comments related to just the state of the nation right now. But I really only have one scripture that I'm going to lift up, and I'm letting y'all know what that scripture is early on, because I think I'm going to share it in a way that you're not used to hearing it shared. Um, so while I'm, you know, uh, making my comments. Make sure you turn to Proverbs 22, verse 6. And just keep it right there for a minute uh, because I'm going to hopefully prove to you that it's not saying what you think it's saying, but it's actually a really good thing that it's not saying what you think it's saying. So, to start off, we understand that right now, we are living in a world that men in particular are under major attack. Uh, right now, uh, there's commentary that's going about that says that, you know, why do we need men? Okay, so before we can get to the father thing, you know, there's a contingence that doesn't even 
like men. So um, we know that that those attitudes come from things like feminism and the uh, what they call the sexual revolution, where like a counterfeit, the adversary projects things in the hearts and minds of mankind that totally pervert how God intended things to be. We also know that there was always going to be strife between men and women because of sin, because of the original sin in the garden. It automatically put a barrier between women and men, one that we've been trying to reconcile ever since. Because hearts, and heart is a, a big word in everything that I'm going to share today, because it is really the uh, convictions of one's heart that if your heart is hardened, you will never understand what I'm saying. But if your heart is open to the possibilities of God's word, then this is going to be an enlightenment and uh, a motivation to, um, you know, move you forward, progress you towards a beautiful, beautiful life experience right here in this cold, hard world. So we know what we're dealing with because we have uh, angry women, frustrated women, hurt women that have just made decisions that says, ha, huh, forsake the man, okay, we can have babies on our own, we can do bad on our own, we can live on our own, we don't need a whole gender, a whole gender. By the way, it takes man and woman, two genders, in order to create life, but no, we'd rather create life by any other mechanism other than the natural uh, process that God biologically created us to do. And so we end up with this world where men have been replaced by governments in the U.S. here. We could say Uncle Sam has become many people's daddy because now instead of having the dependable man that's going to go out there and what they say uh bring home the bacon that's what they the, the phrase they used to use anyway you know bring home the bacon and everything like that now it's like uh, i don't need him I, I can i can get by on a program give me some food stamps some ebt's let me do that because I don't really need a man to provide me any kind of financial security. I don't need a man to provide any kind of comfort and warmth. I don't need a man to provide any kind of leadership because I can do all these things on my own. That's the nature of the world. I'm, I'm not stating anything that's not going on right now. If you want to know why our world is just run amok, it's because... Men have been emasculated and men have bought into it. So I'm not just blaming women because men have bought into that same program and have been so afraid of being men and thinking like men and living like men that we now, you know, pacify women and, and children and all the other genders that have been created by man. We pacify to those things as opposed to being like a Joshua who says, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That has gone out the window. And I've been fortunately reading a lot of Father's Day posts from a lot of good women who have actually acknowledged the maleness of their fathers, the leadership of their fathers, the navigating uh, purposes of their fathers and whether those fathers are still alive or whether they have gone on to glory. What I have read today, and this has come from women, what I have read today has been an encouragement for my heart, even from the comments that I have gotten from my own daughters 
all three of them have responded to me today and have honored me. And I can appreciate that because y'all know I have not changed. And I'm not playing the game of this world because this world has everything set up for all of us to fail. And if we keep going through woke agenda and we keep going through every avenue but Christ, who, by the way, gives us the example of having a heavenly father. Now we can go to the model prayer, our father. Doesn't say anything about mothers. No shade to mothers. Okay, but our father. We pray to the father through Christ, not through the mother, not through a woman, none of that. So if you are, you know, entertaining uh, religions or or uh, agendas that are speaking to Mother God, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, those things are totally anti-Christ. And they go against the very nature of God. The whole blasted book of Proverbs is basically a conversation between a loving father and children. Literally. So, I'm bringing all this up because uh, it, it's talking about uh, or, or leading me to Proverbs 22.6. But before I get there, I have to acknowledge some men that have actually made a profound difference in my life. And, and when I say a profound difference, I'm basically talking about each one of these men, for the most part, have done something or said something to me personally that has totally affected my way of living in this Christian life and challenged me and in some cases chastised me to really study to show myself approved unto God you know, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So some of these names you may know, some you may not know, uh, and no shade to the many men who have poured into my life. But these men, and there's six of them, and then there's two others I'm going to bring up as well. Uh, but these six men have deposited something in me that has totally changed the course of my life for the better. Okay, so the first one is my earthly father, Louis A. McElwain Jr., a man's man, a man that I cannot put into words the impact that he's had in my life and those that follow me on Facebook Please, please go to my page, and I put out a blog about him. Yes, it's long, just like me, but um, it's worth it because you'll come away knowing how I feel about my father. Okay, um, as far as I'm concerned, on this earth, other than Christ, we put Christ in his own category, but my father, the greatest storyteller who ever lived, um, and the greatest teacher who did not teach academically, but taught by his lifestyle. And I'm not putting him on a pedestal above God because I also know the chinks in his armor and we all have them. But let me tell you, pound for pound, moment by moment, there has been no man that has made a greater impact on me that is totally human that I could have at the top of my list other than my dad, my pop, as I called him in life. Then uh, there's another young man. In fact, all these guys, I think for the most part, except for maybe one and my dad, uh, are younger than me. So I'm telling you, I can get it from any source. Jeremy Dixon. And Jeremy Dixon is a pastor in the state of Maryland. Forgive me because I can't remember uh, the, the name of his place of worship right now. 
But um, Jeremy uh, doesn't even know that I'm going to say something like this. But Jeremy helped me more than any other person to understand Psalm 1 and 2 and how it was saying something entirely different than what I thought it was saying and how it actually was a revelation of Jesus Christ. If y'all haven't heard me talk about that, um, please, please, please just consider meditating on Psalm 1 and 2 and think about Christ more than how we should be as people, but understand that it was the revelation of Jesus Christ that was given to David right there in the first and second uh, chapters of Psalms. And so I thank Jeremy for that because I literally interviewed Jeremy and he hit me with that and I was like, oh my goodness. So that's, uh, that's his place in my, I'll call it my hall of fatherly fame. All right. Uh, then comes Marlon Brown. Marlon Brown is the host of Straight Talk on YouTube. Um, I've also not interviewed him, but have actually uh, been a guest, and he interviewed me, uh, I think a year and a half ago, something like that. Um, and actually, because of Marlon, I met another great man who's back on my list this time, but by the name of Felton Baker, uh, or as we call him, Shep. But anyway, Marlon Brown, another one who hit me uh, through uh, YouTube with this whole entire way of looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, realizing, oh my God, I could, I, I, you know what? I've been in the gospel ministry for 30 years and didn't realize, man, my, the price was paid on the cross. I didn't even understand what that meant and why I was still playing this game of, you know, we fall down, but we get up. I was still playing that game and not realizing who I really was in Christ, a new creation. And, and he broke that down in a way that had me literally bawling like a baby. At 2 a.m. in the morning, by the way, uh, looking at that program. So the next person, probably I've spent more time than anyone else physically talking about every aspect of the gospel. And no matter what I say, and if you think that I have been blessed in any way, this guy right here that I'm getting ready to uh, mention, he's a gazillion light years ahead of me in his understanding of biblical things. But I still hang on to that uh, coattail from time to time to, uh, you know, ask him certain things about certain passages. And that would be Philip Howell. Um, he's someone I've also interviewed, if you go through my uh, YouTube uh, clips, He's someone that I've had a relationship now probably close to 13, 14 years. And uh, many times we have walked alone together in ministry things as he helped me to understand that the identity of what we call church today is nothing more than a matrix and he's the one that helped me understand that there was a life outside of tradition that you could actually get to the core and the real truth of the gospel. Uh, then it brings me to another interesting young man that I also got to know through um, YouTube and through television because I followed him for many, many years, probably over 25 years at this point. Uh, but his name is Kurt Schneider. Uh, we would know him uh, as Rabbi Schneider. And he has um, a program that's called, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, gosh, something, uh, the Jewish Jesus. Now, nah, it's escaping my, 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 my mind right now. But if you just put up Rabbi Schneider, it'll come, it'll come up. And he gives me 
the understanding of the scriptures from a Messianic Jewish perspective. And I found that to be so enlightening because many passages that we read, um, you when you understand the, the historical Jewish account and then marry that to the fulfillment that came through Christ, it gives you a whole different way of looking at scripture and it will blow your mind. Hey, Sherry. Okay, Sherry and I go back. We go back to high school. Go tech. All right. Um, so, uh, by the way, Sherry is a wonderful, uh, sweet person that um, supports uh, our ministry and, and, and just uh, verbally supports us all the time. Uh, so anyway, um, didn't want to leave out Kurt Schneider. And then... Corey Miner, he is also on YouTube. Wow, I'm getting a lot of YouTube here. Um, but he is the host of Smart Christian Channel. And Corey, I love Corey because, man, Corey, he lays out his testimony. He is not ashamed to talk about himself. I won't do it. Go to uh, YouTube, pull up Smart Christian Channel, learn something because this guy is awesome and he is the inspiration today of why I am talking about Proverbs 22 and 6 so I'm not going to spoil that but I just wanted to get that out then I mentioned two other men that fall into a separate category because as we talk about men today and fathers in particular these are two men that um, they, they just, I don't even know how to put in words, they encourage my heart because these are men who have taken on the mantle of raising children that are not their own and giving the private and public perspective that it never made a difference. And uh, the first one is Matthew Elliott. Now Matthew Elliott is the husband of my niece, one of my nieces, Jylynn Elliott, uh, formerly known as Jylynn Grant. And Matt, as we call him, uh, embraced not only my niece, but at that time my niece was a single parent, and her son, KJ, who is, man, KJ, oh my gosh, he is a teenager now, like, getting ready to uh, go to the next level, uh, you know, to, uh, in his uh, collegiate career. He's close, all right? Um, but Matt came in and loved him in a way that I could see firsthand that, wow, he wasn't only good for my niece, but he was also so good for KJ. And he took what could have been a horror story for KJ. And he, all I can say is, if you didn't know the family, you'd never know that he is in there as an adoptive son and not biological. I, amazing. And I, every time I'm in that family dynamic, it just blows me away. So thank you, Matt. And then uh, one Francisco Cardona. And Francisco has uh, actually touched our own daughter, Amy, and has taken on Amy's three boys and, again, treated them as his own. And, again, he has been so positive where things could have gone off the, the, the track. He has been the one man who has made a superior difference in their lives. And I could not leave him out of this conversation today because now as we go to the, the scripture, we are all children of adoption. <laughs> All right. So, so we who are Gentile, we are grafted in as children of adoption. 
by our Heavenly Father. And so we come in as orphans. And I know we don't think about that all the time because we just think that we's always saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, fire, baptized, all that stuff y'all like to talk about. But in fact, we were at enmity with our own Father until we could see the blood of Jesus. That's just the way it is. And it's only by His grace and mercy do we now say, Abba, Father. We, that's the only way that we can experience Him is because of the acknowledgement that we were bastard children. That's who we were. But now, with His covering, and that's the only covering, y'all, that we need to really talk about. With His covering, we now become heirs, joint heirs even, to the throne of grace. I know I went a long way, but believe me, <laughs> what I need to share in Proverbs 22, 6 will not take long. So believe it or not, I'm almost done. I brought up Proverbs 22, 6 because this has been a verse that many parents have gone to. It has been preached in many sermons. And I've got to tell you, it hasn't always been preached the way that it appears to be written. I'm going to read a version of the, or translation better, of the Bible that I never really go to. But it's the best way to read this verse in the Hebrew that it was originally written. And so I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. It says, train up a child according to his way, okay? And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And earlier I gave Corey Minor of Smart Christian Channel the props that he was the inspiration because I think several years ago I heard him talking about this passage and I've always wanted to talk about it because um, it was profound what he said and, and honestly I kind of rejected what he said at first until I really did my homework. But what Corey brought up and what I'm going to bring up today is if God is the perfect parent, and I think we can all, being a Christian program, I think we can all acknowledge without any disparity that God is the perfect parent. So if God is the perfect parent, parent, excuse me, and he instructs us perfectly, how come God's return on his investment is more similar to Major League Baseball? And let me explain what I'm talking about. In baseball, if someone actually goes to the plate, and that just means they're getting ready to hit that ball, and they go to the plate, and they strike out Seven times out of ten. That means they only put the ball in play three times out of ten chances. I'm trying to keep my wife. You 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 with me there? Here. Keep my wife. Uh, uh, anyway, so <laughs> the batter goes up ten times, uh -huh. puts the ball in play three times. Now, on average, that means he's failed more than he succeeded. Yet, in baseball, if he does that three out of ten times, he is in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> and no arguments, all right? God offers all of humanity the perfect training. But how many of us actually put the ball in play? Now, 
We cannot call our Father in heaven a failure because he's not. And this is where Proverbs 22, 6, oh my gosh, when I understood it, it gave me a whole different way of looking at the passage and it actually became an encouragement to me as opposed to something like, how come I got these children and they ain't doing what I'm telling them to do? But now it makes perfect sense because I want to tell you exactly what's being said here. And what's being said here is really a matter of how things are translated. Now, I'm living in Chikimula, Guatemala. And that means I've had to learn Spanish. And I'm still learning Spanish. And I feel like I'll be spending the rest of my life learning Spanish. Okay? Well, you're way ahead of me. Okay. But this is what I've learned. And this is not only about Spanish, but any language. There are just some phrases or some words that simply do not translate to English the same way. I know this through music because when I'm trying to translate an a, a English song into a Spanish one, there's certain words sometimes I can't even use or phrases that just don't make sense in Spanish. And so, why am I talking about that? Because when you're dealing with translations in the Bible, the translator has to come up with the closest thing. And when we look at Proverbs 22, 6, normally you hear, train up a child in the way that they should go, or something like that, right? So... But that's not how the Hebrew works because the Hebrew actually talks about dedicating a child according to the mouth of the way or according to the way the child acts, which changes the whole nature of that verse. Now, I, don't, I know this doesn't make for exciting uh, Bible conversation, but if you understand this core principle, you understand that many of our houses of worship have been using this passage to say, hey, you just train them up to do the biblical things. And when they become old, mature, whatever you want to call that, they will not depart from it. Well, you know what? That's not accurate. Because you could be the the best father, you could be the best mother even, and you could live according to the scriptures and train and teach according to the scriptures, and there's no guarantee that that child is going to ever get the understanding that, hey, my father and mother weren't crazy. They may not do that, all right? They might just continue to wallow in sin. But when we look at Proverbs 22, 6, in the proper manner as a warning to the parent, in this case, the father, because we'll deal with fathers today, then we read this as if you keep on co-signing on the very nature of your children, they're going to stay the same way, they will not depart from their tendencies, their emotions, their uh, uh, processes, because you haven't imparted anything to change them. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, it's saying that if you just allow children to do whatever they feel like, so let's be real with that. If a child comes up to you and says, I feel like being a girl, and you just change them into, or allow them to change and change their gender and cut off their biological parts, you have failed. Okay? If, if one day your child is walking around with an with a, a X-Man uh, superhero uh, toy, and the next day got a Barbie, 
okay, and you just say, oh, it's okay, you can be either one of them, you have failed. If you allow for the children to dictate how they're going to live with no counsel, with no instruction, that's what it's saying here, actually. I'm not discouraging you guys from training up the children to be faithful to the gospel. Don't get me wrong. But what's actually being said in Proverbs 22, 6, thank you, Corey Minor, is actually saying, but if you just let the children just go off and do their own thing or just uh, make decisions based on their own whims, when they go get older, they're going to keep on doing the same thing because you didn't impart anything in them. So it's a warning to us to actually be fatherly. If our Father in heaven did not give us Jesus Christ and did not have a plan for salvation, did not have a plan for redemption, did not have a plan for reconciliation, we would just go off the cliff like the, the, the swine that just went off the cliff. That's all we would be. Because we had no fatherly counsel. And so I'm bringing that up today is because our world has been allowing for non-believers to dictate the order of things. That's the whole point here. Why do we keep allowing the world to tell us how to raise our children? Why do we keep allowing the world to tell us how to be men, how to be fathers? When God has given us the perfect example just in his relationship between him and Jesus. If we just look to that example and how Jesus reverenced his father, how the father reverenced him then we would understand that, you know, we could actually have a, a lot easier way to go as parents, as fathers today, than the way that the world system, world system tells you, oh, buy this book, buy that book. This is how we can relate to our children. I'm not trying to relate to my child. <laughs> Myra's heard this so many times. I'm not trying to relate to my child. I'm there to actually bring law and order, but also to have a soft answer. It works each way. Did y'all not know in the Jewish culture, it was actually the men that were actually the, had the responsibility of teaching the children the scriptures. It was something that after a meal, they would sit down and literally have Bible study. Or oh, in those days, Torah <laughs> studies. Okay? And you want to know why the, the Jewish culture is so ingrained the the, the the word, as they understand, is so ingrained in them is because they had to sit down and they had to memorize passages. Today, we allow for TV, we allow for uh, TikTok and Facebook and other forms of social media to be the fathers for our children. And we don't just... Sometimes just make ourselves available and teach the hard lessons. Now, with the five biological, well, not five biological, but the five children that we have, three of them are biological to us, two are adopted, okay? But I can guarantee you in the Mac Myra house, we don't sugarcoat anything. And they're all grown, okay? But... I'm not trying to relate. Myra's not trying to relate. We are there to instruct. That's really the encouragement. The whole book of Proverbs is instructions. The whole book of James are instructions on how to live a Christian life. How to be able to navigate 
the world, because the world wants you to just have men competing in women's events, to have women hate men, to have little girls hate boys. That's what the world is. They're just a separatist. They are just divisive. And there's no, have you noticed that all these angry people, they never ever seem to smile or just look <laughs> like they're content with their lives? Nothing is ever good enough? Have you ever noticed that? And how you can take, and I'm going to go there, someone like a Caitlin Clark, for you uh, women's basketball uh, viewers, who has done nothing to deserve the animosity that has come her way. The world wants you to hate her because she's actually good. Can you imagine? And honestly, the WNBA would not even be a part of my conversation or the many conversations in Sports Nation right now. But she has brought attention to it. I'm not saying she's the greatest basketball player ever. I'm not even saying she's all that good now as a pro. But what I am saying is that this woman has done nothing to garner the animosity and the hostility that has come her way. And this is just one reflection on the very nature of our world. Why is it that if I stand up and say, for God I live and for God I die, I'm immediately being crucified because I just happen to believe in my Savior, Jesus Christ. Why is it that in the workplace, people have to be conditioned to understand concepts that don't really vie with their personal beliefs, but if I say, well, when does somebody understand about my faith in Jesus Christ, you are nullified. <laughs> Have you thought about that? That's the world that we're in. That's why it's so exciting to be in this world right now because we have the opportunity that our forefathers never had to actually live the prophecy that the prophets of old have shared thousands of years ago. We're living right in it. And if we fall to the okie doke of the world, especially as fathers, we have failed our children. Yes, I'm closing. Yes, I want my children. I, I would love for them all to revere me and love me in the same manner that I love them. Is there a guarantee that that's going to happen? No. But that's not my concern. My concern is, is that even if they reject my counsel, that they will at least go on to live successfully. So I'm not going to allow for any of my children, and that's not only the ones that we claim, but the other ones that have ad adopted themselves into our family. I'm not going to just put up with any old thing coming from any of them. But if they are willing to hear the truth, then they will have a father and mother who will love them unconditionally for life. That's the message today, y'all. I don't know if that met the criteria of how I promoted that this week, but that's where God had me today. That's it, guys. We just wanted to come on this day that is acknowledged as Father's Day and just encourage you to heed the counsel of the men in your lives that are acting as fathers, whether they are biologically connected or connected just at the heart. Um, and we as well mourn for those whose fathers have gone on. Both of our fathers are now deceased, at least on this earth, but we know that they live eternally and we pray that they're eternally in Christ. 
um, with that said, um, you know, love the old man today. The old man's not perfect. The old man, sometimes the old man can be stubborn. The old man can be all kind of things. But the old man loves you. And God loves you. And again, as the perfect parent, knowing that all will not take his counsel, he does at least offer his plan of salvation to every one of his children if we would simply believe. God bless you. And God keep you in his perfect peace with our minds staying on Jesus. God bless you.